Hello, my name is Jeff Gomez. I'm the host of Self-Inflicted RL Nostalgia, a fan's Guided by Voices podcast. I'm also the author of Zeppelin Over Dayton, Guided by Voices album by album, which comes out this June. I just received my advanced author copies of the book. I wanted to uh, show it to everyone, show you the cover, some of the images on the inside. Um, and because most of the images were from my own personal collection, I thought I could show those as well, just to kind of to show you what's inside the book. Um, I want to talk about the publisher for a second. It's being published by Jawbone Press, which is an English uh, company devoted to publishing books about music. That is all they do. They are sincere music fans. And when I was finishing the manuscript and I went to my wall of music books over there and sort of just looked at who did some cool books, uh, Jawbone was one of the ones that came right to my mind. Uh, they did this really great uh, biography of Devo a couple of years ago, great book about a great band. Uh, just last year, they published this bio of Brian Jonestown Massacre, a book that has uh, an awful lot in common with GBV. Uh, they were both on TVT at the same time, and they were signed by the same a &R guy, Adam Shore. Really good book about a really good band. And just to show you what music fans they are, my editor at the company is also an author, and he wrote this really fabulous book about Bowie uh, a, a while ago, about Bowie's time in Berlin. So they are sincere music fans, and I'm overjoyed to be uh, working with them for the GBV book. So here it is. Bam, I love that cover. It's a sign, back at the back. Um, now we've got two blurbs on the back. I won't uh, read them out here, but uh, I'll post them to the Facebook page this week, but I'll tell you who wrote the blurbs. Uh, the first is by a guy named Ryan Walsh. He wrote a really great book a couple of years ago called Astral Weeks about the rock scene in Boston in 68. He's also a hell of a musician. He's in a really good band called Hallelujah the Hills. This is their most recent record. Check that out. The second blurb is by a guy you might have heard of named Tobin Sprout. I am um, beyond overjoyed uh, that Toby was kind enough to uh, A, read the book, and then uh, give me a really nice um, uh, quote for the back cover. Um, you know, it means the world to me. He's a, he's a hell of a musician. I love his work solo and with GBV, and so I'm just over the moon that he uh, can, uh, uh, did that for me, and I, I think that's fantastic. Uh, back to the book. So one of the things too about Jawbone that they, they're they known for is doing really high quality books. Um, super nice cover, um, uh, really heavy uh, weight pages, full color insert here. You know, it's just, it's really, really, really well done. Um, if you look at, here's a, a book, by the way, a very good book about Prague. I'm deep into a Prague phase now. Um, but if you just sort of even look at like the, the the quality of the pages, you know, this 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 book here, you know, the pages are almost gray, whereas the pages here are white. Um, and, you know, this has got just a, a black and white insert, which, by the way, for a book on Prague makes no sense. And so we're very colorful, colorful people, literally and figuratively. Um, where, again, you know, this book's got uh, really heavy paper and uh, the images are all, you know, except for where they're, of course, black and white. But really, really well done. Uh, I want to say too about the images. A fun thing about this book being, you know, pretty recent. We only went to press uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, was we were able to include things like uh, a guy on Facebook was kind enough to let me use his photo of the set list from New Year's Eve. We've got the Heed Fist uh, poster from the summer there. We even got in what is uh, hopefully not going to be the last known photo of the band playing live, at least certainly for a while. But this is a a, a shot from. The New Year's Eve show at the Teragram Ballroom in Los Angeles, the infamous New Year's Eve show where they played 100 songs. I was there. It was awesome. Um, was scheduled to see them, gosh, in just a couple of weeks in San Francisco. Of course, that's been canceled with uh, all the uh, coronavirus stuff, so hopefully they'll be back playing uh, soon. Uh, but I'm really happy to have that shot in here. Another thing about the cover, it's got these cool, these are called French flaps. It's a very silly thing I know, but as an author, I've always wanted to have those. I think I first saw them in the 90s on Generation X by Douglas Copeland. Um, and it's just a, a super classy uh, part of the package there. So, you know, really couldn't be happier with uh, the job that Jawbone did on this. Uh, and I think everyone's going to be a kick out of it. Uh, again, this is based on the podcast, but it's totally uh, brought up to date. Uh, I've incorporated all the information I learned from the interviews with uh, Travis Harrison, Adam Shore, Robert Griffin, uh, and in fact, Robert Griffin and I had a, a quite extensive uh, correspondence going about the making of B-1000, um, and he told me and shared things with me that I have not read in print or heard uh, anywhere else. So I think this is uh, going to be the definitive uh, look at that, um, that record, and I think the band. It's got 28 chapters. It goes right up through Sweating the Plague, um, and so it's, um, I think it's like 32 years 
uh, 28 records, 521 songs. So it's uh, a whole lot of work and I, I couldn't be happier that this is going to be available soon. So again, wanted to talk about some of the images that are in there that I procured for this. Actually, it's in chronological order here. So we've got, this is the first one. This is a, looks like a press photo from Matador right around the time that they signed. Kind of an interesting thing about this is that there's only four guys in the group. Um, there's no bass player. We got Mitch, we got Kevin, we got uh, Bob, and a, what was that, like an anorak? It looks like a Britpop guy there, uh, and Toby. Uh, so no Greg Demos, but also no uh, Jim Gurr yet. So that's kind of interesting. This was the uh, Guided by Verdi uh, lineup. This is after the so-called classic lineup got disbanded, and instead of getting a, a whole new group, Bob basically uh, grafted himself onto uh, Cobra Verde, a, a, a fine Cleveland band uh, made out of Death of Samantha that he'd always liked and admired, uh, and basically sort of fronted them only for one record and a tour for uh, Mag Yearwig. But what's interesting is, of course, Doug Gillard from that band uh, has, has stayed with him kind of on and off, although mostly on, certainly for the past five or six years, and has ended up being the longest term collaborator and I think the best, too, that, that Bob has ever had. So super, super happy that he is uh, still in the band. It's kind of a weird one. This is a TVT shot probably around the time of, uh, I guess, isolation drills. Because um, I think this is they're in like a control tower uh, for, uh, what do you call that, uh, in, at an airport. Um, is that Tim Tobias there with the binoculars? I think what's interesting is we got John McCann here. He was only in the group for a short period of time as, as the drummer. Uh, only appeared on one record, which is Universal Truths and Cycles. After that, they got in Kevin March, just for those two records, those last two records on uh, Matador. And of course, Kevin March is in the band now. An amazing, amazing drummer. I think the best drummer the band's ever had. And his recent uh, solo stuff or, or, or songs that have appeared on, you know, August by Cake and, and some of the B-sides are just totally, totally phenomenal. I love Kevin March. I hope he puts out a, a solo record soon because I, 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 I love his stuff. Uh, I've got a couple of magazine covers in the uh, in the book. So Magnet Magazine, they've been a fan of Bob's for uh, a long time. This is uh, just from the past couple of years. I think it's from 2017 or so. Uh, had Bob on the cover. This is a, a really fun uh, cover, a fun article where he was interviewed by uh, punk legend Mike Watt from uh, San Pedro, the Minutemen, uh, Firehose. Um, it's a really fun cover, and there's a guy on the Facebook page who did a really cool painting of this if you want to sort of check that out. Here is uh, when the band was really sort of getting big. This is at the end, this is the January 95 issue. So really coming off of their, uh, I think what's considered their biggest year ever, 1994. Saw B-1000 come out, it was widely hailed as a masterpiece. Um, but also like three, maybe four uh, EPs from different companies came out. Uh, and what's interesting here is you got uh, Bob's brother Jim is in the photo, which he appeared in a lot around this time. Uh, which is kind of a little bit weird. He was never really an official member of the band, although I guess with GBV, what, is, you know, what does official really mean? Um, I think Bob liked having him around. It's pretty cool that you know, his brother was uh, in a lot of these shots and is actually on the cover of the uh, Tiger Bomb EP. So they're on the cover here. And what's sort of interesting if you flip through this is this is, so this is 1995, and I'll tell you this magazine looks very 90s, down to some of the, the clothes, like this guy with the hair, some of these fonts even. Without people were just getting into desktop publishing and they could do all these funky kind of things, so they did. So there is a cover story on the band. Let's see here. Again, you got now you got Jim Greer though in the, in the shots, and then you got uh, um, uh, Jim Pollard in there as well. What I think was interesting is there was a 1994 wrap up. And they talked about the 30 best uh, albums in 1994. And of course, woohoo, GBV there at number one for B1000. Sebado, Bake Sale, number two. Huh. Crooked Rain, Crooked Rain. Yeah, that's, that's Pavement's best record. I could see that being probably number two in that Sebado record. Yeah, so, so. Um, but again, just, you know, it's a, it's a plethora of 90s indie rock here with uh, Jawbox. You got what? Grifters, uh, Super Chunk, uh, Wedding Presents, uh, Shellac. So, you know, really fun to see. All these names here, um, and you know, a lot of these bands are still around. You got Beck just put out a record, um, so it's really kind of a fun little piece of uh, history there. Uh, I want to talk about got the first issue of Eat 
magazine I got a copy of, and this is um, Bob's Literary Magazine, although um, it's mainly collages the last couple of years. This one has a whole lot of poetry. One actually had some like short stories. That was kind of a cool one. And what's neat about this, uh, this magazine or book, whatever you want to call it, is that there are these a, a lot of um, collages that then went, later went on to be covers of some of the records. So this was sort of ended up being um, a cover for Sergeant Disco, the double record by Circus Devils. It's interesting to note too is this uh, sand sort of desert background is the same one that appears on Alien Lanes. Speaking of, um, here is I guess I don't know how serious this was as a uh, uh, initial title for or initial cover rather for Alien Lanes, but this is that's in here and it says uh, you know it says guided by voices, Alien Lanes, and you can see the wavy pattern that would official that it would later appear on the uh, the official Alien Lanes record. It was already part of the graphics, so Bob obviously liked that and wanted to include that early on. Interesting page too, because you have two um, collages that later form the cover of uh, records. You got the it's a cover for what is that uh, Boston Spaceships Brown Submarine, and of course uh, 2004's the last GBB record for a while, anyways, which is that really really nice and evocative collage for um, Half Smiles of the Decomposed. What's interesting about seeing them in this format is that uh, they're often larger than uh, the covers that later came out, so you get to see the whole thing. So this was interesting too. I guess this was the, uh, it says it was the initial uh, cover for, I think it was a fir his first solo record, Waved Out. I actually think, actually think that's a better cover. Bob looking really cool and young there. Uh, keeping with Eat, the Eat theme, uh, this is the most recent issue and by this by this time the, the the earlier ones are almost like chat books and this one is just really really nice uh, speaking of high quality uh, paper um, you know, nice and glossy uh, a much bigger size also comes with a one-sided seven inch unfortunately the seven inch is not very good um, but again what's interesting to flip through these pages is you see collages that later were turned into record covers and sometimes because of uh, the shape, there are elements that are in the collage that aren't part of the cover. So this is the cover to was last year's Sweating the Plague. And the cover for the LP, you know, starts like right here because it's a square. And you miss this detail at the top, which looks like it's a photo of a guy covered in paint. And there's another one in here from, this is the cover of the most recent record, uh, Surrender Your Poppy Field, which again sort of starts at the face and goes down because it's a square and you sort of miss this other element. Uh, that's part of the original collage. So kind of kind of cool to see them in their natural states, if you will. Um, I want to talk. One of the things that I think is interesting in the book is I traced as many instances of Bob's inspiration as I could. So of course, it's a classic uh, record B thousand here, and this is really I think made the rounds on the internet. But still, this is taken from a 1990 copy of National Geographic. And there's the original there. So you can see it's much bigger. And what, um, what Robert Griffin did is when he sort of took the elements that Bob provided him, as you can see, first of all, if you look real closely, you can see the strips of scotch tape that are really holding this thing down. Uh, this element here is actually a, li a light post, like a lamp post, and Griffin uh, removed the actual post part of it to evoke the idea of like a, a UFO, you know, so the hardcore UFOs. Uh, he told me that this break in the graphic here was meant to um, illustrate or be evocative of some of the, the, the breaks or dropouts of the songs. You think of those famous uh, amp drops. Um, so that's part of the inspiration for that. And of course, I've got in the book too, so this is the director's cut. So this element here, uh, Griffin doubled it, but this element here of the splatter art kind of guy with the train, this was meant to be the original B-1000 cover that uh, Griffin certainly liked, uh, but thought it wasn't, again, representative uh, perhaps of, uh, of the record, and so I wanted to, to use that other element that Bob provided. Uh, next up, so speaking of Alien Lane, so this is the Alien Lane's cover that everybody knows and loves. I actually don't think it's a great cover. I think this brown is, is, is just, you know, very brown. Uh, this font looks a little bit 90s. Again, everybody had, you know, their Macintoshes and, and were doing these things. Um, but you've got the, the desert background and this wavy pattern that was also part of that initial um, sort of mock-up that was in Eat Magazine. And this is, I think this is only sort of discovered in the past kind of six months or so that I saw someone post it on Facebook. The original source of this is this 1968 jazz record of like 
uh, jingles, advertising jingles done in a jazz vein. Um, I have to say, I do have the record, but I have not played it yet. Even in a quarantine, uh, I just don't have a lot of time to, to do stuff like that. Uh, and if you look closely, I think it's upside down. I think they took the elements, you can see this kind of blue M here. So I think they took the original waviness, cut it out, and kind of turned it upside down. So it's kind of interesting to see those two side by side. Uh, historically speaking, next we've got the record Under the Bushes, Under the Stars. Uh, and this element here, the guy, uh, is taken from another issue of National Geographic, although this one is from 1963, so it's much more vintage. What I think is interesting about the, uh, the B-1000 example is this is only from 1990. You know, B-1000 was 1994, and so, you know, you tend to think of a lot of Bob's art being very sort of like, you know, vintage or found, and yet this was, you know, only a couple of years old. Um, and I kind of wonder what would have happened if back in the day, or today, I don't know how these things work, uh, you know, National Geographic would have known that that element was taken from here, you know, would they have minded, would they have cared, would they have tried to, uh, you know, have it removed. Um, so here we've got the guy, you have a 1963 copy of National Geographic, in an article about Florida, you got the guy. So I guess this is a, this is a Native American doing some sort of a sport, Looks a little bit like kind of like lacrosse or something. So what I I don't love this cover mainly because I think this element is just kind of like cut out and and sort of globbed on there. And also you can see that it's it's pretty small in the original, and yet they they really had to blow it up. So it doesn't uh, it's not really sort of high quality, and it's just kind of like glommed on to the rest of of the cover there. Though it's interesting when you when you flip through this magazine, you think of you know what else Bob could have used for uh, collages, and especially with some of this. Uh, vintage stuff. Some of this is very, you know, evocative, and, and you could really see him having fun with using some of these uh, various elements. So you can see how that would be ripe for him to use. Uh, next up, we had Mag Earwig. This is, I think, personally my favorite GBV sleeve. I just think that is, and it's also really timeless, and this is, what, 97, and yet this looks, this isn't dated at all. Whereas again, for my money, that Alan Lane's cover with um, you know the, the fonts and stuff does it look a little dated. So you'll notice the the face there, little sun guy, I guess, was taken from some images associated with a I don't know if it's medieval um, uh, il illustrated manuscript called Splendor Solus. And you can see the the sun guy there. It's the same sun guy from the cover of uh, Mag Gearwick. Uh, moving forward a bit to um, Isolation Drills. This is their last record for TVT. What was this, 2001? Got the Jets on the cover. Got the Rune, the uh, sort of GBV logo right there. At the back, we got Jets. That was inspired by this Blue Oyster Cult record from the 70s. What is this, 74? Um, that had Jets and the band and they've got their Blue Oyster Colt logo. Not sure if they call that a rune or not. We got that there, even the back. So you look at these sort of side by side and you really sort of, you really see the, the inspiration there. Not that again, uh, GBB ever really needed uh, flight references in their work being from Ohio and the Wright brothers and all that kind of stuff. So you can see those side by side. So I thought that was kind of cool to have those um, side by side. Again, haven't listened to that record. I probably should. Just a couple of other little mementos here uh, for Do the Collapse. Uh, the, the record company put out these uh, beer coasters. Certainly makes sense for the band. Um, in the back, Rest in Peace got produced by Rick Okasik. I actually think that's how you say his name. I always said it as Okasik, but I believe those in the know say it's Okasik. It's kind of a fun thing. And then sticking with um, Do the Collapse, this is the uh, ill-fated... Um, promo for uh, Hold On Hope that has the um, the radio mix that the band, that the, the label wanted this to be the single, but wanted to have this remix by this hit maker from the 90s. Um, uh, and, and the A&R guy had to fly to London to try to convince the band. It's a great story that uh, Adam Shore, the A&R man at the time, uh, told me for the podcast that is in the book. And there's just a, a really big section on this, this really interesting, controversial song. 
Um, I actually love this song. I know a lot of people don't, including Pollard. Um, but also, uh, that's really the key to the band's fortunes at the time, because without that song, the band would not have been uh, signed to TVT in the first place. So you may hate it, but it led to basically the band um, getting a you know second wind after leaving Matador. So uh, that's all I've got to show. Again, these are all from the new book, Zeppelin Over Dayton, Guided by Voices, album by album. This will be out in June, available for pre-order now. Uh, if you like the band, I think you're going to like it.